Okay, I'm going to get started. So thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully, to make it worth your time. Um, basically, the whole talk is just around uh, informing this uh, red question mark. We're just trying. We're just impressed when students make progress. By that, I mean developing skills and learning foreign languages and uh, learning new statistical techniques, whatever it is. When people really make progress, develop their talents. And we want to know how people do that. We think it's through engagement, uh, and we're trying to get to the point where we can give schools or teachers or athletic coaches or parents recommendations on what students can do, what athletes can do, what whoever can do to make significant, reliable progress. That's the question. That's the question. Okay, uh, a couple of slides of preface to get us warmed up. I want to see if this talk's relevant to what you do. And if you're a motivation researcher, I think the talk topic's uh, intrinsic to what you study. Uh, this goes all the way back to the uh, pioneer, pioneering days of uh, motivation research. Uh, I'm talking about Hull and Atkinson and going all the way back. And they would manipulate motivational states and then they would measure engagement as the dependent measure. So, all, in, in one sense, all engagement is, is a public expression of motivation. Motivation is private. I can't see your goals and your interests and your preferences. I, I, can't, I can't see those if I'm the teacher in front of a class. Instead, I see what, how you express those interests and goals and achievement motivation and things like this. So, I, I can measure effort and latency and persistence and probability response and all the things that Hull and Atkinson and uh, people like that would measure as their dependent measure. So if, there's a very close relationship between motivation and engagement. One's private and one's a public expression of that underlying motivational state. So partly interested in just because to be a full motivation researcher, I think you also need to understand how motivation expresses itself. And then, uh, so that's part of the equation. The other part is uh, engagement is uniquely important in its own right, separate, not really separate, but distinct from motivational functions. It does something that motivation doesn't necessarily do. Uh, and this is the uh, striving to make academic progress. Whatever your outcome of interest would be, whether it's a student's GPA or an athlete's ability to serve a volleyball or whatever the talent is, um, uh, how do people strive to make that progress? And that, that, that's a separate question than a motivation question. Why do they strive for it would be the motivation question. But when they're actually uh, trying to develop skill, what are they doing? And we really want to know what, what works, what they're doing to give our, our recommendations. Okay, so that's the preface. Uh, hopefully there's some hit with what you're interested in uh, or what you've read about it and thought about it in the past. Okay, how I got started on this uh, research is lots of findings like this from myself, but lots of other people as well. Uh, this really bothers me, uh, this uh, significant direct path. Uh, if, if we were really good engagement researchers, that path wouldn't exist. It should be zero. Uh, if that path is uh, significant, then we don't really understand engagement. We're not measuring it right. We're not conceptualizing it right. We don't really understand. We don't know what we're talking about fully. Because here's my here's a question that's really plagued me for 10 years, and I would love if you could answer in part or in full for me. Uh, how can motivation promote academic progress, skills, talent, uh, except through engagement? Is there anything that motivation does to get to an outcome like skill? other than going through engagement. Uh, it should be fully mediated, if it, and if it's not, well. That's only if you include everything under the sun under engagement. Yeah. We're, we're going to get very specific. Yeah, I know, I know. And we're going to get it down to two or three variables. Okay. So it's, uh, we're not going to cheat on this uh, by, uh, we're, th that's the driving question. now. You tell me if you're satisfied with the answer that we get to at the end. And then we'll come back, hopefully in discussion, and ask the question. 
but just conceptually, uh, not, not in terms of measurement or anything like that, uh, what, what does motivation do? How do I go from an interest to a skill? How do I go from a goal to learning a foreign language? Whatever the motivation is with the outcome, how do you get there except through engagement? If there's no other way, then this should be, this, this should disappear. And when that disappears, we really understand what engagement is doing. That's, that's the, the question or the logic or that. Okay, um, I think there's really only two ways to make progress. Uh, one is engagement, and one is to uh, have the, be a beneficiary of high quality instruction. There's lots of ways you can define instruction. I just came up with mentoring and coaching and training, maybe access to resources. I don't know if that's really uh, instruction, but education and uh, high quality schools, high quality teachers, um, high quality resources, things like that. So if you give me really good instruction uh, and I work really hard at it, I'll make progress. Uh, there may be other variables, but really, um, let me I'll put that on hold. Uh, so this is a simple model. This is why we're going to focus on the solid line. Just going to try to understand the path from engagement to progress. Not going to focus on instruction. We're going to control for that. i partial it out. It's not a, it's not a, uh, a research program about instruction. It's a research program about uh, engagement. Now, this is the same thing. These, these two pictures are the same, but we're not really interested in uh, what grades you are, how talented you are as a gymnast or something like this. What we're interested in is making progress. So it's a longitudinal dependent measure. Who, at whatever skill level you are today, we're going to come back next week and measure your singing ability or whatever it is, your uh, skill at the piano, and see how much you, prog you made progress. That's our outcome measure. That's our dependent measure. It's progress. Okay. But we don't really care about your baseline level of skill. We care about your progress. So we measure longitudinally. But this is the same thing. Uh, I don't know if it, I can describe it well. Uh, but the reason I wanted to do it longitudinally, there's lots of covariates, uh, confounds, predictors of how skilled or talented you are. How, how, how good are you at uh, HLM software? Well, it's partly uh, your engagement. There's a hundred other variables. Uh, everything from IQ and SES and quality of training and all that. We, we throw all those in as as valid predictors of baseline skill, baseline engagement, baseline uh, quality of instruction. Uh, people who are really talented usually get good, higher quality instruction, uh, like going to the good schools and things like this. So what we're really interested in, after you control for all these variables, we want to see uh, uh, a change in skill, but really we're interested in this. If you change your engagement, can you change your skill? So we're in, this is why I double started. This is what we're really interested in, and we can study this lots of ways. We can do it like I've drawn it. We can do it longitudinally. Just go to a classroom and track an academic year in a foreign language class, and we can measure your skill and your engagement uh, early, middle, at the end of the academic year, and we can test our model longitudinally. Or we can do an experiment where we can manipulate, change your engagement to see if we can change your skill. Or we could do an intervention. Or we could come in and say, we're going to uh, show you how to be really engaged and see if that can facilitate uh, your skill. Okay. So really, uh, that's what we're interested in. This double spot. That's, that's going to be our uh, approach to research. Okay. So here's the, um, I don't know if you know the engagement literature. It's a messy literature. Uh, there is no theory of engagement. Uh, it's kind of uh, weird. Uh, uh, it's, it's a messy literature. It, a, a lot of different voices, and they can't get together. They're school psychologists, they're educational psychologists, cognitive psychologists. There's a big uh, branch of self-regulated learning people, things like that. Um, uh, but this is as cl the closest the consensus you can get if you go to like ARA and you talk with the uh, engagement city or something like that. So here's a definition of how actively involved someone is in a learning activity. So I'm watching this group, say there's a, a, a you know, I'm in a school, uh, and um, people are working on their uh, lesson together, and I can say that he's really actively involved, she's asleep, she's passive, she's texting, but this guy's really actively involved, is how they think about this. 
And they're saying basically um, what active involvement is is three aspects. It's uh, behavioral, so how effortful you are. Uh, it's cognition, uh, how strategic you are. And it's emotion, uh, how enthusiastic you are. So this is just how they measure on questionnaires. But somehow you can measure these three things with a self-report questionnaire or a teacher observation, create this latent variable from these three indicators, and that's going to be what you use to predict progress. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't like this. The reason I got involved in this research is because this is, I think this is kind of a dead end. It's unsatisfying. It doesn't really predict uh, progress fully. It leaves us going back to here. If we get with that kind of theoretical understanding, it leaves us with results like that. So I'd really like to improve on this. So a couple of criticisms. I don't like the definition uh, because it's just descriptive. Uh, it, it, maybe it tells you how to recognize engagement when you see it, like a teacher in a classroom or a raider making an observation. But it, it doesn't have any uh, purpose to it. Uh, it doesn't have a function to it. So I really like these alternative definitions. I would like to graduate from a descriptive conceptual definition to a functional uh, conceptual definition. Even though it may sound vague at first, uh, it's, what we, it's, uh, it's whatever students do to make progress. So we can study students who make progress and say, what did she do? that the ones who didn't make progress uh, made. And the definition I prefer, and I'll try to explain it as I go, it's a student-initiated pathway. It's what the student actually does, pursues, in order to make academic progress. So this is a function. What does engagement do uh, to translate itself into progress? And then I really have a problem down here with uh, emotional engagement, uh, because as a motivation researcher, uh, if you have questions like this, you probably recognize items like that. If you're an SDT researcher, if you study intrinsic motivation, that's exactly how they measure uh, intrinsic motivation, self-report intrinsic motivation uh, or interest or something like this. So it's really confounded here uh, with lots of things, like with motivation, intrinsic motivation. It's actually uh, confounded with outcomes, like well-being, uh, things like this. So I, I, I'm going to... Um, question the inclusion of emotional engagement. So instead of throwing everything into it, uh, we're going to try to discriminate and just get the stuff that these active ingredients. Okay, so here's a thought process, then I'll show you a couple of studies that we did to test this uh, reasoning. So here's a starting point. Um, here's a, as good as a consensus as can be uh, created in the engagement literature, what is engagement? It's a three-component construct of behavior, cognition, and emotion. Uh, I'm going to argue if we really want to uh, explain progress, we need to add something that some students are doing to make progress. I'm going to call it agency, uh, agentic engagement. So I'm going to add uh, a fourth component. And then um, keep thinking about how to revise this model to really explain who makes progress. I'm going to question emotional engagement. Uh, at first, I thought we should kick it out because uh, it's too confounded. But it, it, it has a role, clearly it has a role. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to define what that is. Uh, so really, the active ingredients are three over here, behavior, cognition, and agency. So I'm going to try to change the conceptual definition and the operational definition of engagement. OK, let me, uh, sorry about the busy slides, but uh, why should we include agency? Why should we question? or reconceptualize uh, emotion. Uh, first, what uh, agency is, uh, here's the definition. Students proactive, you can fit in specific behaviors for this, but generally it's proactive, transactional, constructive contribution into the flow of instruction they receive. That just means, uh, well, the opposite of this is just being passive and receiving whatever instruction from the teacher or coach that you get. Take it as it is. Uh, somebody who's agentic will be proactive, try to get ahead of the lesson and bend it in their direction. You know, teacher, can we talk about this? It'll be transactional. I'll negotiate. I'll work with the teacher to uh, provide an optimal learning environment for myself. And it's constructive. It's not the, the counterproductive stuff like complaining and stuff like this. It's, it's stuff that satisfies my motivations and allows me to make progress. So here's how we measure it on a questionnaire. But this is just a definition of what we're talking about. 
what student this is what students are doing who really develop skill and make progress. They're also uh, behavioral and cognitive. So why does it need to be added? Uh, two big reasons. Uh, first, if you measure agency engagement and then you include it in your study along with the other three components of engagement and you see if it can independently predict progress after controlling for behavior, emotion, and cognition. And just about every study, in fact every study that we've done, it does. It explains unique variance. That means it increases the R square in progress explained. So it's do, it's, it's, the, these students are doing something beyond effort, strategy, and enthusiasm. Okay? And this, this is what they're doing. So that's one reason. It predicts unique or independent variance in progress. The other reason, it's got a unique function. It's proactive instead of reactive. If you think about what engagement is, the teacher walks over and assigns a lesson or gives a book to read or something like this, and then students react to the lesson plan with some amount of effort, some amount of enthusiasm, some amount of strategy. But agency is different. It's proactive. Uh, it takes place before the teacher provides the learning activity. Uh, so what the agency does besides predict progress, it also uh, gives the students the agency to change the learning environment give themselves optimal conditions, I'll explain this, to make progress. It's got a proactive function, but the other aspects don't, which is going to be very valuable. Okay, why should we uh, reconsider emotional engagement? Uh, here's a, a definition, positive relations, energy mobilizing emotions like enthusiasm and interest. Uh, first, basically, uh, it's really difficult to put into a model where you try to predict uh, uh, outcomes you don't know where it goes. Is it engagement? Is it an antecedent of engagement? Uh, an engagement facilitator? That's where I think of it mostly. Like, is it mo motivation? So, I'm interested, and that leads me to be effortful or strategic. I think it's an engagement facilitator rather than engagement itself. That needs a lot of explanation, but basically, uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's closer to motivation than engagement. It's, uh, it's not what people do, it's what people experience and feel. It, it should be, a, it's a different category. And there are other places we could put it, but let me just give you that one reason. And then, if you include it and, and look at all these studies, I've got a few references. Um, so imagine, these are, this is a pretty tr traditional study. Four predictors, behavior engagement, emotional engagement, cognitive engagement, agentic engagement, predicting things like grades and progress and skill. Okay? Multiple regression or SEM model, and what happens if you look at these over and over, the previous slide said the path from agency to progress is uh, almost always significant, independent variance explaining. And if you look at uh, emotion, it's almost never significant. It's, is the cognitive dimension similar though, in that could that be seen as reasons for engaging in action but not engagement itself? Yeah. I think this is personally important to me, is that a cognitive? That's going to be my conclusion. That's going to be my conclusion. I've already got people upset at me. So I'm going to, I'm going to reconsider cognition. I'll try to explain it to you. Um, but I've already got people upset at me for messing with emotion. They really don't like this idea. And, and it's got a lot of intuitive sense. You go into a classroom, it's really important when you watch students how enthusiastically they participate. It's just obvious that interest matters and enjoyment matters. And it's just so obvious that we, we can't take that out of engagement. It's, so, it's core. But I'm saying, yeah, I don't want to take it out. I kind of did it once. But I really just want to replace it. I say, yeah, it's really important. But what is it doing? It's really motivating engagement more than being engagement itself. And it's also very hard if you want to do an intervention. You walk over to students. You say, OK. I want you to be more engaged, so be more interested. Now be, enjoy this more. It would really fall flat, uh, the intervention. Like, I don't know how to be more interested. Uh, so for lots of reasons. Uh, I, I do recognize uh, engage, emotions always correlated with the outcomes. It's always really highly correlated. But that doesn't mean it is a unique predictor. It just means it's correlated. 
instructional quality is a function of student motivation. Teachers are better if students are more motivated, and so motivation will affect uh, progress through teacher quality. Through instruction, through teacher quality. All right, I like it. <laughs> it's every bit as important. Uh, and I'm, I, I've, you got to give me a break. This is just a 40 minute talk. So I'm just going to talk about engagement. But if, uh, when we get there, and we're not close, a full model of engagement has to have a bright side and a dark side. So disengagement is just as important and sometimes more important than engagement. So we really have to understand not only enthusiasm and interest and enjoyment and uh, curiosity, but it's equally important to understand frustration and discouragement and boredom and things like this. Uh, that's really important. And when we get a full model, it'll be the, the, the bright side processes and the dark side to explain who makes progress, but also who, who stalls and doesn't make progress and drops out of school and withdraws and uh, their talent withers and things like this. You have to explain that as much. But I'm not going to do that today. Uh, discuss the time. Um, I, I actually buy what you're talking about in terms of emotion and I think parsimony is typical of science, so I'm on board with that. Um, you got some evidence too. Yeah, yeah, no, the evidence <laughs> is also good. Um, I, I am wondering um, when you, and I've, I've read a little bit of what you've written about the Gentile. Do you think that when you sort of break down what we're talking about with agenda engagement, if you, if you wanted to, and you wanted to write the items in a way that still reflected what you're talking about with agenda engagement, do you, do you think that you could write them in such a way that they would uh, load onto the, the behavioral and the cognitive aspects of engagement? Like yes. Uh, and we, 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 we developed the scale. Uh, we, we, you know, we came up with lots of, uh, from lots of sources, we came up with lots of items. Yeah. And an item like this will not load with agency or load with behavior. Uh, I participate actively in class discussion. We, we, we thought that might be an agency, uh, but, but it loads with behavior. Uh, um, like do, we, do we really need that agentic engagement construct, or, or could we just slightly broaden the behavioral engagement, slightly broaden the cognitive engagement. It's absolutely unique. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. I'll show, I, I'm gonna, that's the main point today, is try to make the case. It's crucial. It's not a subset of, another, of behavior and cognition. It's not. Uh, and, uh, okay. Great. Good. I, I'll try to make the case. Great. Um, how would you phrase the item so that it doesn't Confined too much with the motivation autonomy uh, part of the self connection. Because I feel like it would overlap a lot. You have agency and, and, and um, choosing what you want to do with the overlap. Yeah, it's kind of tricky. The, the, I don't know, the, maybe it's too uh, concrete operation, but one way to do that is just keep testing the measurement model. You measure autonomy, need satisfaction, you measure agentic engagement. They should be correlated because uh, one causes the other. Actually, both cause both, but that's another question. So they should load separately. And they should not, no item on agency should slip over and cross load or even load fully with autonomy. So just a very concrete answer is you just keep looking at the measurement models and make sure that they're distinct. You, you do that statistically, you do it theoretically and conceptually with your operational definition. So we define uh, agency in terms of action. All the items, I do this, I do this, I do this. And autonomy is more like I need, I experience, I want. Uh, so your model based, is based on a denial of motivational behaviors. You no, know, no, no, uh, no. You're in, uh, <laughs> if it's motiv if behavior, uh, then it's engagement and it's not motivation. And if it's not behavioral, then it's motivation. And that seems like a slippery. Also, uh, your definition uh, uh, is a little circular uh, uh, in that uh, engagement is whatever comes, uh, whatever uh, creates uh, progress. 
The starting point is circular. It's, 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 it's bad research to do a Maslow kind of approach, go find the self-actualizers and what do they do, and then say that that's somehow positive. And that we, we kind of start there because we're trying to see, did we miss something that the students who are making progress doing? So that's a question, just are we missing something? So we go look at people who really make a lot of progress and we think we're missing agency. So once we have that, then it's not just whatever they do to make progress. Because we go back and we, we'll figure this out. What exactly is this concept? So we can use it as a predictive rather than a, a post hoc kind of way to understand. And then we'll, we'll make these predictions that if you'll do this or if you'll change this longitudinal, we've done an experiment, uh, things like that, interventions in order to see if progress follows. So it starts off that way, but it doesn't end up that way. And then the, I, 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 it wasn't a good measure of uh, agency, but I think it was the Pintrick uh, measure of agency. When we looked at it, it was indistinguishable from self-concept. Uh, from uh, self -concept. And self-concept, would, you would clearly define that as a motivational variable, I assume. Self-concept. Yeah. Positive self-belief. Yeah, well, maybe not. No, I would. I would. Yeah, okay. I would. Uh, Ten yeah. years ago, I didn't. But I think I do now. <laughs> uh, I think I do now. Uh, uh, we consider it like an outcome, but it's a whole type of motivational problem. Yeah. And at least that measure of agency was, uh, uh, which is probably the more, one of the more widely used ones, uh, was not distinguishable from self-concept. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're trying to take a sloppy literature that's got all this confusion. Exactly what's cognitive engagement? That, that pulls people's hair out exactly what cognitive engagement is. I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, but what we're trying to do is, okay, that, con that conceptualization, that conceptual definition, operational definition of the agency is not what translates into progress. So let's really go back. It's got a fruitful concept. We go back to Richard de Charnes. We got a lot of ideas off what he had. His hit steer ratio. I don't know if you ever heard of this. Maybe we just watch classrooms and what are students doing to uh, bend the lesson in their direction of motivational satisfaction. So he just rated well, all everything that teachers did and came up with a concept uh, what we translated into what is called agency. So we keep taking these general ideas, we take Bandura, we take uh, the charms, DC, things like this, and we say we're going to take it from an engagement point of view and really figure out what this active ingredient is. So we're on this path. We're not there yet. We're on this path to get there. Okay, so it's agency behavior, not a sense of agency. That's very important. Very it's important. A sense of agency. You can have agency or self-efficacy uh, or something like this predicting action. And when it becomes action, we call it engagement. Okay. It's motivated behavior, but that's, that, that was within the preface. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you measure agency, as motivation and agency as behavior, the correlation is like 0.8. Uh, it's, it's really one is a reflection of the other. Um, so they're really overlapping. But we're going to really say this is motivation and this is behavior. They're separate constructs. And we're going to target our intervention of the action, not of the motivation. OK, so here's some, uh, just some quick data. I don't want to go into the, the details because I like the questions better. But sorry about the abbreviations. It's really kind of a big picture. I think it's a straightforward or simple study. You just follow students in lots of different subject matters, science, math, English, and Korean. You just, and then at the end of the semester, you look at their grades and who made the high grades in the study. So we're going to just measure in the first half of the semester, behavior, emotion, cognition, and agentic engagement. And then we're going to measure in the second half of the semester, change in behavior, change in emotion, change in... Uh, agency and change in cognition. And then we're going to use those eight predictors with some statistical controls like gender and grade level to explain who makes progress. We're going to do this uh, in a couple studies. That's basically the research design. Time one, time two, and then time three is our outcome. And here, uh, the prediction is that agentic engagement will explain achievement and emotion won't. So the results, I just kind of summarized it for you by the, the green check marks how effortful or persistent you were at the first of the class and how more effortful you became during the class, you upped or decreased your effort, that predicted grades, and how much you changed your agency during the semester. 
So the, the, the active ingredient is not agency or agentic engagement, it's change in agentic engagement. So uh, this, this, the first study is good data for us. Uh, emotional engagement did not predict uh, grades, uh, agency did. Is Above and beyond behavior and cognition. Is there, a, I mean, is there a correlation between emotional engagement and grades? If anybody wanted to see the correlations, I do have the correlations, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're all they're all quite high. Yeah. Here's time one. Oh, so the emotion comes in, because I'm just based on what you're saying, you're not saying that the emotional part is unimportant, but that maybe it's earlier downstream to behavioral engagement. Our first Something. idea, and it might be right, is it's 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 just it's just earlier in the stream. Yeah. But our our our, our rethought, uh, go back and read all this literature. It it actually has a, a different function. And I'll get to that. We're going to put it somewhere else. Okay, another study. Here we just changed the uh, outcome because we wanted to be, have a control for baseline achievement. So it's, it's, you can criticize the measure, but you, you get the spirit of why we did it. This is self-report academic progress or achievement. What, what, do you, what grade do you think you're going to make? Because we, it allows us to get uh, a baseline measure of achievement. Okay, self-report, actually they cor in, in Korea, they correlate very high with actual achievement. But anyway, if you do this and you partial out baseline achievement, only uh, a change, I become more effortful in the course for, for, for whatever reason, motivation, instruction, uh, peer, climate, whatever the reason was, I, be I, I put up more effort than I did at the beginning of the course and that uh, increased my anticipated performance. Now, here's a measure I really like. Uh, the measure is, we're going to measure this time one, time two, time three. This is self-report academic progress. So we ask questions like, uh, I learned a lot in this class. I made a lot of progress. I developed new skills. So it's a perceived progress measure. But we do get to have it, you know, control for it at time one, things like this. Now in this study, I don't want to go into the details, but we, all, we measured emotional engagement and self-reported intrinsic motivation. And our hypothesis was, was Agentic engagement would predict uh, growth in skill, perceived skill, or uh, academic progress. Emotional engagement would not. But if emotional engagement did, uh, it would drop out if we entered self-report intrinsic motivation. It's confounded. It's, uh, uh, so actually, in this study, like a few other studies, like one out of ten, uh, emotional engagement, change in emotional engagement, I became more curious, more interested, more enthusiastic during the semester for whatever reason, like instruction. It actually is significant. But then you put in intrinsic motivation and it drops out. And you just have a behavior and agency predicting perceived progress again. Let me keep going with uh, another dependent measure. This is uh, why we would need agency uh, for long. One, it predicts progress. And two, it does something the other ones can. So then we're measuring perceived autonomy support. We're asking the, the students about their perceptions of their teacher as supporting their autonomy, uh, creating a motivation and support of a need satisfying learning environment. My teacher understands me, my teacher listens to me, teacher asks me what I would like to do before making a suggestion. I didn't like that. If you do this and you have all the controls, blah, 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 including baseline autonomy support, only agency predicts uh, the ability to uh, modify or recruit autonomy and support from the teacher. Actually changing my learning environment. The teacher is maybe less controlling and more supportive or understanding or listens to me or uh, makes class more interesting. Or... Okay, well, so where does this leave us? Okay. Um, to, to move forward, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Ellen Skinner. I don't know if you know Ellen Skinner, but uh, uh, she's wonderfully talented. Here's her context self-action outcome model. Here's her model, really. Okay, but I'm going to just uh, simplify it uh, for the sake of a, a brief talk. But this is just classic social psychology, educational psychology. In our other research, this would be teachers motivating styles. This would be student need satisfaction or intrinsic motivation. This would be uh, uh, engagement, and this would be whatever outcome, like learning, you're interested in. Okay. So, the teacher affects my motivation, my motivation affects my engagement, and my engagement affects my learning. So, uh, here's the self model. Yes. Now, what we're going to do uh, to try to uh, add in or modify this model 
is we're going to add agentic engagement, reposition, emotional engagement, and we're going to be suspicious of cognitive engagement. It's, it, it's, it's so obviously important to be strategic and use sophisticated learning strategies. That's the whole point of, uh, well, it's, it's just obvious that it's, it's, it's a path to progress. But if you go back and look at all the research that's been done in engagement, trying to predict outcomes, it really has a poor track record. In the, the studies I showed you, cognitive engagement didn't predict anything after you control for behavior, which is just effort, persistence, uh, control for agency. Again, it's got a portrait. So I'm a little suspicious. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that as we go. So this is a self-context. I want to talk about action, so here's an engagement and uh, outcomes. However, whatever your indicator is uh, of, of, of progress. So this is, a, remember that earlier model, we had a behavior, emotion, and cognition. I'm suggesting we should have behavior, agency, and cognition. Uh, this would be, if I'm interested, if I have a goal, if I have a self-concept, how do I get to progress? And we say there's three things that students can do. They can work really hard, they can work strategically, and they can work proactively. Uh, so these paths are, uh, the answer to what can I do to uh, learn a foreign language? These are the three things you can do. And but it's very important to have this uh, path in here too. This is uh, what agency does. These are reactions to the teacher gives me a lesson or I get a book. Uh, this is me getting ahead of my learning opportunities, of my training experience, or whatever it is, and contributing constructively into the learning environment or the teacher's motivating styles what we study. But it can be just like the self-regulated learning people. The people manage their environments, they manage their relationships, things like this. So I'm going to uh, create optimal conditions under which I can make academic progress. I'm going to uh, get the best tutor and I'm going to get the best resources and I'm going to negotiate with the teacher and say, this is the problem I'm having. You know, can we put your lesson aside and can we work on this? I'm really stuck on this. I like to. That's an agentic thing to do. Is it possible? I mean, I, I saw that error and I thought it was going the other way. I, I wonder if that's a proxy for a relationship with teachers. You know, like the kids that ask those questions and direct the classroom have really good relationships. Teachers like them. Um, I'm raising a daughter who seems to be liked by the teachers, and that's what We, we usually measure autonomy support here, and it's so. But is it correlated with a high quality relationship? I don't know if we can distinguish them. Because if, if you see teachers, they dislike a kid. They that kid will not ask questions. They will be yeah. discouraged. Yeah. Yeah. But what we're interested in is is can the students do anything about that? A non-responsive, controlling, uh, disengaged teacher. Can it? Does a, does a student just have to take that? I got a bad teacher. A teacher who doesn't like me. They discriminate against me. They bias against me. They don't give me the benefit of the doubt. They ignore me in class. They t I talk about stuff I'm not interested in. Can the student do anything about that? And what we've studied over and over, yes, they can. I can recruit or bring out autonomy support. Maybe not today, but as the relationship involves, I keep coming in and say, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'd like to work on. Uh, can you give me an example? Can you, and you keep making these requests. If you look at what autonomy support is, the teacher understands me. The teacher listens to what, the way I would like to do things before making the suggestions, uh, things like this. Um, it's really correlated with the teacher likes me. Everything good is correlated with the teacher likes me. But we think the, these students uh, can do something about the quality of their teaching or the quality of their relationship. And it's very important. But let's fix this problem, then I can make progress. Because if I have a really supportive, understanding, uh, structured teacher, then they'll, uh, that'll boost my motivation, which will boost my engagement. It's an indirect path to progress. Is instructional quality not included in this? Or is that just, or is that, uh, is that something that we just, something separate? It, it, that it's really important, but it's not in here. Sort of instructional quality. This is mostly, motivating style. This is mostly the stuff that leads to motivation, not the stuff that leads to knowledge and understanding and schemas and assimilation and accommodation, all but, that stuff. But you're not assuming that instructional quality isn't part of that, it's just 
not included in your model. Yeah. So if you were going to flesh out the model, there'd be something else that is yes. instructional quality, yeah. and that would go to progress. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, there's also a concern about uh, cognitive engagement, which is heresy. I mean, uh, a lot of educational psychologists have their background as cognitive psychologists. Uh, um, are interested in memory support. Now conceptually, again, I don't know if you think it's circular, I'm comfortable with this. I think engagement is action. It's uh, do something to make progress. Behavioral and, and agentic are overt, observable, public, they're action. Whereas cognition, like emotion, is something different. Overt, unobservable, private. I, I can't see your knowledge or your schemas or your conceptual change. This is like, something I can't really see. Uh, again, cognitive engagement has a poor track record. If you do these admittedly simple, like regressions or SEM models, and you look at the path, is cognitive engagement, like elaborative learning strategies and critical thinking, is that predicting progress? And the answer that, that line is almost always dotted, study after study after study. Uh, so this is un un undeniably important. But what is? Uh, so we've reconsidered emotion. Now let's just take a skeptical view of cognition and reconsider it. So uh, here's a, it, it, it's a really messy literature, the cognitive engagement literature. There, there, there's turf wars and everything else, but there's lots of ways you can define and measure it. And I've just listed off some that I, I thought were reasonable or valid. Uh, elaborative, that's the one, the one they use most, deep or elaborative learning strategies. Uh, Self-regulated learning, mental simulation, you can see the list. There's a lot of, lots of ways that you can measure and understand cognitive engagement. Uh, except a lot of people use personal investment. I don't, I don't even know what that is. I think it might be motivation, but uh, I don't know how to measure it. Or that's, you know, a lot of people models if you know the engagement measure. But if, if you go back and look at these studies, they actually, it's a poor track record. Uh, if you uh, rethink things and problem solve, blah, 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 it doesn't really. You think it would, but uh, actually control for behavior and things like that, it doesn't. But there's one type of cognitive engagement that's never been studied really in the engagement literature that uh, looks like it has a lot of promise to predict progress. And that would be goal with there's implementation intentions. And this is kind of a different category. It's not uh, uh, just mentalizing. It's, it's really uh, strategic action. And here's a couple of items on a questionnaire. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, I'll go to the gym. Uh, the television's on, I'll ignore the distractor. Uh, and these are kind of action. Uh, I'll go to the gym. Uh, I'll, I'll start behavior, I'll initiate it. I'll ignore a distractor. Uh, I'll manipulate my concentration. Like this. It's as much action as it is thought. So, um, and these are all uh, purely uh, uh, cognitive manipulations of information. Um, and they, if you look at uh, Goldwitzer's research, uh, he can control for motivation. He usually does goal implementations, controls for that, and then implementations intention and prediction make barriers. So maybe that would work. If it, if it, uh, so let's see. Uh, so if it does, we can put it in here as strategic action implementation, and that might work. Another thing, it, it might uh, fall down here. Uh, it might be uh, a moderator. Uh, so this is, I think I skipped a slide somewhere, but this is uh, where we're getting to. Uh, let me see. Uh, I didn't talk about this one. This is very important. This is where we put emotion now. Um, it could be over here as an energizer of engagement. But you keep reading the, the literature, and, and people say engagement, emotional engagement is important, emotional engagement. And what does it predict? In all the studies, what it does, it predicts the other aspects of engagement. People are interested, work really hard. People are enthusiastic, think strategically. Uh, people uh, who, etc. It really affects the other aspects of engagement. So, borrowing from Ellen Skinner, a couple of other ideas, we think it's probably a moderator. Like, you, st you start to put out effort trying to learn a foreign language, and you'll stop if the negative emotion will stop you. But you'll continue on if the positive emotion will support the effort. So in that sense, emotions are very important. Moderator, uh, ongoing engagement or re-engagement, behaviorally, agentically, and, and
positive. So we, we think that's his role. Between engagement and, uh, and uh, emotion. What's the, what, is there any arrows between uh, emotion and engagement? Yeah, I don't know. These are really highly correlated. Mm -hmm. Also, unfortunately, there's an arrow here as well. And there's another arrow here. In your model, are they, uh, is emotional engagement just correlated with the others? In our model, this is our idea ready to test. Mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we haven't tested it. It's, it's seemingly, now that you've thought of it, it's somewhat easy to test, just statistically see if it's a moderator instead of a predictor. So you could put it here as a fourth predictor, you could put it here as a moderator. Which one fits the data better? Pretty straightforward. It's a simple could question. You, and you could also ask the same question in your, your motivation variables. That could be moderators as well. Yeah. That would surprise us, but hey, if that's if that's what it is, that's what it is. We'll you know we'll get there. But that, that might be, it might be as simple as uh, two paths, but, but probably three. But you have to really redefine what it is. Okay, uh, I know we're out of time. Let's see. Uh, let me just make a case for behavior and uh, agency real fast. This isn't I don't think too controversial. If you're familiar with Erickson's work on deliberate practice. Uh, he says it's a single predictor of progress is hours of deliberate practice, which to us is behavioral engagement. Uh, this one's more controversial. This is just me example. I'm, I'm into jump roping lately. And uh, how do I make progress in jump roping? So these are all the things that uh, I can do agentically. And, what, and just what do they have in common? One, they change the learning environment for the better, make it more motivationally supportive. The other thing they do that is, is harder to see, uh, all these things, uh, better environment, coaching, things like this. It allows me to do today what I haven't been able to do in the past. And that's almost a definition of progress. So this is what agency does. It predicts progress and it predicts uh, a more favorable supportive learning environment. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'll skip this. Uh, what about an intervention? Uh, just two, two or three more slides. What about an intervention? I'm actually suspicious. If you actually, there's lots of engagement interventions in the literature, but go read them, and there's not a real, they're all motivation interventions, every one of them, 100%. Uh, so they'll say, how do you get kids to stay in school? That's their marker of engagement. Well, you create a sense of belongingness and connection and relatedness to the school. And so they manipulate relationship with the teacher of belongingness. So it's a social context or a motivational intervention. And engagement's an outcome, but it's not really an intervention on engagement itself. Uh, and it actually, that kind of makes sense to me. Uh, because you don't want to divorce engagement from motivation. And so what we do is actually, rather than do, uh, rather than recommend engagement interventions, we recommend working with the teacher. And that goes back all the way to our very first intervention study. If you really want to motivate and engage students, you work with the teachers on their motivating style. And that was 2004. still haven't changed my mind on where the point of the intervention should be. I mean, engagement's a downstream process. Uh, last, uh, last slide is uh, implications for schooling. And um, if you go to schools and uh, principals and you ask them uh, what they're trying to do, they're trying to produce outcomes. And I've got a list for all the uh, possible outcomes you have. Uh, the problem with that, by focusing on outcomes, um, it's too easy to be, uh, have controlling policies and instructional practices. It's too easy to be controlling as you try to uh, promote these uh, outcomes, like graduation rates or something like that. Uh, but if you focus on engagement, if you focus on the predictors of these outcomes, say, we're in here not to uh, increase your standardized test score, we're in here to increase your engagement. And if there's a very close relationship between engagement and outcomes, then you don't devalue the outcomes in any way. We're absolutely trying to get you in the best schools and raise your standardized test scores and increase the graduation rate. We're absolutely doing that, but we're going to do it through engagement. Uh, so uh, if you monitor engagement or build instruction and school policies around promoting engagement, uh, you lose all the detrimental side effects that are a controlling path to outcomes. And you just ask, 
How can we engage students? How can we create high quality motivation? How can we create engagement cultures and motivate and solve? It's a different question. I mean, it gets you to the same place, but it does it in a much more educational, psychology friendly way. But of course, that depends on there being a very close relationship between engagement and outcomes, a near one R square. So if, if we know engagements predict outcomes and we're trying to get there with our theory, then you can focus on outcomes and you'll get the, I mean focus on engagement and you'll get the outcomes without all the side effects of controlling instruction to policies. Let me I wanted to just make one point. Uh, I asked John Marshall to uh, fill the slot because we had a slot and it was only a little over a week ago. And I'm just amazed. Now I understand that this is something that you've been working on for a long time, so it's pulling it together. But still, what a wonderful presentation to pull together in such a short period of time. Wonderful. It was a short time. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. Two days. Provocative. <laughs> provocative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Is Bandura's self-efficacy, that's, uh, that's a motivation, right? Yes. Okay. He has a separate concept. It's very correlated. His agency. We borrowed a lot of his ideas. Yeah. But he has, if you read Bandura, uh, he emphasizes uh, this proactive, manipulate change your environment for the better. Uh, as, as a key component of his uh, model, and, and we're more on that heavily. And his agency is the belief that you can do that. Yes, yes, the belief that you can change and uh, improve your environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we just say this: it's uh, the action you take to create a more supportive, motivationally supportive learning environment for yourself. So I negotiate with my tutor. Uh, this is what I like to do, this is what I'm concerned about, this is what I'm interested in, and all this negotiation and transactional back and forth, and the, the tutor bends and says, okay, I'll go in that direction, rather than the direction that I was originally thinking about. I'll, I'll, and you've affected the quality of the instruction you receive. We and should. can you create that change without creating this change in the sense of it? If the sense of it is important, maybe that's what you need to work on and give people behavioral strategies of how to do that. Well, there's a researcher in California, she, she said um, what she's working on is mindset. Mindset towards growth and agency and give people the mindset that they can change their environments and their fates and their uh, things like this and their learning capacities and their uh, mathematical skill, and you give them the mindset, and that will unleash the agency. So that's kind of another path that people are taking. Um, and if you change their behavior and you don't change their belief, is it still going to have an effect on outcomes? We, we tested that, and, and I'll, I'll come back to, uh, um, I don't recommend it. Uh, if you just give people, they tell people, this is how to be agentic. It actually doesn't really translate uh, into progress. If you say, uh, speak up, show initiative, make suggestions, ask questions, uh, it doesn't translate. It, in fact, the teacher may think you're obnoxious. The, the peers may think you're a teacher's pet, obnoxious, and hogging. They, it may really backfire. So if you just have the behaviors without the support, so, but if you ask questions because you're interested, uh, if you uh, make a suggestion because you have a goal, if it's autonomy-infused agency, it really translates into progress. So you need the motivation as much as you need the agency. Uh, so that's why we don't recommend just an agency or an effort intervention. We think it'll fall flat and maybe even backfire. There's a possibility that these things could be additive. And I agree with you that intervening with teachers is, is the way to go, is the way that we do it as well. But I wonder if you if you added an intervention of uh, gentle engagement directly with students to an autonomous support or in support intervention, might be added. 
I think you're exactly right. Because what we find in these interventions, when it really, the, the, the classrooms really transform, and you know the students are in good hands, is two things happen. Uh, the autonomy supportive teacher really is, is able to engage students in learning. You go in there, the students are really engaged. The teacher listens and they, you know, takes their perspective. Autonomy supports driving all this engagement. But then, if you really have the magic happen, you need the students to, to follow their interests and make suggestions and ask questions and feed into the teacher. And when you get this reciprocal, we call it transactional, uh, back and forth between the two, that's when the magic happens. The students are really engaged in making suggestions and showing initiative and blah, 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 and the teachers are supporting all that initiative, and there's going to be a lot of learning and progress that happens in that class. And, and have, you, have you tested that at all? We've tested it longitudinally, not in an intervention, not experimentally. We actually did one experiment where we manipulated autonomy, support, and agency at the same time. Um, but if you look at it longitudinally, this happens in every one of our data sets. The, the crossover, both the teachers are affecting the students, the students are affecting the teachers, and these are really high functioning classrooms. I think we should write an ARC on that. Mm -hmm. but that's, that's the magic. That's the ultimate. That's a better path, uh, or maybe we'll, we'll get there eventually if we make a recommendation for uh, uh, an engagement intervention, it would be this double barrel intervention. We're going to change. We're going to upgrade the quality of the motivating style. At the same time, we're upgrading the quality of the uh, 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 engagement of the students, the student together, rather than just agency by itself. I just I think that'll backfire. So I'm hesitant to do that. But this is the, I think that's the path to go. Let's do them together. Let's do them together. And that would be even stronger than a, a autonomy supportive intervention by itself, which we know produces already really strong effects. What, could we even so imagine an ex, uh, experiment, uh, autonomy supportive intervention only, control group, and autonomy supportive intervention with agency boost, and see if you get more learning and progress above and beyond an uh, autonomy supportive intervention only. There might be a way to break it into some. There might be a way to bring some of those other perspectives, like that California research where you mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, some of those people who are looking at me, that, that might make sense. Well, I heard about the intervention at the STT conference, so maybe it will be I understand that um, agent engagement equals to the common support teacher, but the, is there any um, other um, data output or did you test it any uh, relationship between uh, agent engagement to control teacher or chaos teacher? So maybe because it the difference. So if I don't have a study in mind, but we often measure not only agency but agentic engagement, but agentic disengagement. I'm passive, only do this. I'm non-responsive to the teacher. I hide things like this, and maybe that would predict better predict the controlling path. Uh, it's an empirical question. It's, it's just instead of just having these two variables of agency or agentic engagement and autonomy support, let's just measure uh, the complexity of motivating style, complexity of what students are doing, and see if it's affecting more than just autonomy support. Is it lessening control? Uh, that would be so valuable if it did. Uh, I've seen so many arguments, students and adolescents with their teachers and their parents, and the the. Uh, the, the student will say, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I want to do, this is my goal in life, and the teacher or the parent will say, no, that's not right, you're doing the wrong thing, you won't get into the best school that way, suppress, suppress. So there's this battle between my agency and a controlling parent. And the question is, can my agency, my voice, my speaking up for myself, reduce how controlling you are towards me? I certainly would think it would, but I think all these relationships between the student and the teacher are moderated. They depend on how responsive the teacher is. It could backfire. The more you complain, the harder I come down on you, uh, like a prison. If you start complaining, I'll punish you. I'll, I'll beat you into submission. So it could backfire. So if the teacher is responsive, 
then you can minimize the lesson to control. They'll listen, they'll be responsive, they'll change their parenting. If they're responsive, yes. Maybe some other variable, like involvement, if they really care about your welfare, they'll, they'll lessen their control or something like that. It could be the same with principles and things like this. But how else are you going to change somebody's motivated style? How people treat you, the, the instruction they provide. Uh, we've really worked hard on this. Uh, we only know of two ways you can change somebody's motivated style. Only two ways. We really looked at lots of ways. One is our theory, STT-based, formal, well-prepared, uh, evidence-based intervention. I'm going to teach you how to be autonomy support. Uh, with modeling and all that, so that's one way that works. The other way is to be responsive to students, and that is responsive to their agency. If students will tell you what they're interested in, they'll tell you what direction they want to go, if what, they'll tell you what their dreams are. If you're responsive to that, you will change your motivated style. So you can use your students as uh, your data point to change or inform a higher quality motivated style. That's it for motivated style. How you be more structured, how you be more uh, autonomy supportive, how you be more involved. Is uh, that's only two ways I know. If you know more than that, please let me know. <laughs> Otherwise, motivation motivates itself pretty stable. And if it's uh, counterproductive, like controlling and chaotic, it stays that way. How do you change a motivated style, a controlling instructor? It's really hard. So we do interventions. But I hope just listen to your students might be another way. Or it is another way, at least to become more autonomous. Well, those are mainly ideas, but we're thinking about engagement. We think it has a lot of potential to improve the educational process, uh, to, prove, to improve uh, students' life in school, so they actually find it productive and profitable, and they can realize their goals and their dreams and things like this, but they know how to become better at this skill. So I think there's a lot of uh, educational richness in the pursuit of not only motivation, but also engagement. I'll let you decide whether that's a good path to go or not.